I don't know where to start, right? That's a common feeling when people are uh, getting to know technology or learning technology. Oh, I'm hearing it. It's great in front of my camera. Okay. There we go. Um, and if, you, if you're a person who needs to make some adjustments to the default interface before you can really get started using technology, then that whole process of getting started is much harder. So the first discovery tool that I'm demonstrating is the place to start, right? That's, that's the whole goal of this project is to provide a place where um, wh whether you're an 86 year old retired teacher who's opening up a new laptop for the first time or you're a, a blind student who needs to go and access course materials from a lab in, in college, or maybe you're a kid with a broken arm who's suddenly finding it harder to type, uh, this tool lets you discover and express your essential technology access preferences. So it's designed to give you enough customization to overcome major barriers and just get going online. It's not going to leave you with a perfectly um, configured machine, but enough that you can um, independently carry on and, and take the next steps. Um, and it's part of a larger effort, the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure, GPII, that um, provides a whole ecosystem of preference tools, preference storage, and preference activation features. So some of those other tools will let people fine tune their preferences, and this tool is just gonna get them in the door where they can get going. And for many people, this might be the only tool that they need. Um, in principle, it can cover any kind of preference that is enactable only in software. Um, and in this demo, there are 11 important preferences. Uh, so the demo itself, on the left-hand side, there's a... Um, Sélectionner pour le français. There's a preference setting area. And... Um, on the right hand side, there's a preview and the preview uh, can contain um, whatever typical kind of content is appropriate for the setting in which this tool is being presented. So that might be um, in a school environment, it might be in a senior center where uh, seniors are learning technology. Um, depending on what the kind of material is that that people are accessing, the, the preview can be different. So here I'm showing you the version of this tool with the preview for a sort of educational setting with some learning material about electrons. Okay. Um, so one of the big challenges about designing a tool like this is that it can't make any assumptions about the person that's using it. You can't assume that they could see or they could hear or that they understand English or um, how easily they can read. Um, it also doesn't know what kind of level of computer experience the person has who's going to be coming at it. So, so it has to be usable with, with minimum assumptions about all of these things. Um, so the way that um, the tool achieves this is by starting off with a multimodal approach. So we have visuals and we have audio. And the audio... Uh, Select to turn... English is currently selected. The audio is, is relatively slow so that more people can understand it. And the text is relatively large so that it's more readable. And the, the combination of the two um, is intended to provide at least enough access that somebody could either see it or hear it well enough or both to get going. Um, but having this big text that's read out loud um, is, is no good if you can't understand the language that the text is in. So the very first preference has to be setting the language. And um, if I choose some of the other languages. Seleccioner pour le français. See, each option is read out in the language, in the target language. So somebody can recognize their language and choose that. Okay, so uh, Maud, let's, um, 
Yeah, let's let's step through the tool in the shoes of somebody who might be a typical kind of a user. Um, so I want to start with Maud. She's an 86-year-old retired teacher, and her daughter bought her a laptop. And um, she went to the local computer store, and they kind of set it up for her to access her email. And then they point her to this tool to um, do her own initial setup. Okay. So first of all, she's selected English. She's got the speech still on because that's the default. And she's going to continue on. Select to, the next to continue. Step. You see that every time she um, points at something, uh, a very large tooltip appears with a longer explanation of, of what it, the option is and what will happen if she selects it. So this is step two of 15. Welcome. This tool will guide you through setting up your computer the way you like it best. Press H to hear this again. Okay, so when she moves to a new screen, she has the speech explanation of what this screen is about and what, what steps she's on out of the 15. And this is just an introductory screen that explains what's going to happen. She's Select to go to next step. This is step three of 15. Do you want to hear the screen read out loud? Press H to hear this again. Okay, Maud doesn't really want to hear the screen read out loud. She can see it just fine on the thing. So um, she's going to say no. I don't select to voice is off. So when she made that selection, she had some, some feedback saying that the voice had been turned off. Uh, you can see very clearly which one is selected. So now she's going to go on in silence to the next step. Now the next preference is for uh, the speech rate, which now that she's turned voice off isn't really very relevant to her. Um, she doesn't care about that setting, so she's going to continue on. So this one is the first one of the, the visual settings. Now we're going to try, we have a whole sequence, we're going to adjust the appearance of the screen. This one is, is colors and we're starting off on the original, but there are two high contrast color schemes that are available and she can see what they look like, not only in the uh, tool control, but in the preview of, of the web page. So she might decide that she likes white on black, that it's easier to read perhaps with the higher contrast. The next step is a, a magnification control. So by choosing smaller or larger, you can adjust the magnification on the interface and see the, the difference that makes to being able to read the text. You can also adjust the space between letters. So this is a, a setting that can make a really big difference for older adults, especially in readability. Um, but it's one of these ones that you have to really see what it looks like in order to, to decide if it works for you or not. So here, um, Maud can experiment with different spacings between the letters and see what she likes. She'll space them out a little bit. And um, a similar setting is the space between the lines. So again, she can make the lines further apart to improve readability. Um, does she want to see subtitles or captions when the video is playing? Well, um, Maud does have trouble hearing sometimes and sometimes she's using her computer in a, a bit of a noisy environment where her dog is barking, something. So she might actually say, you know, yes, I do want video captions to be on. And um, actually in the preview, it happens that there is a video in here, although she would have to scroll to find it. And if my internet connection was as good as it should be, the video would be playing and we'd see the captions. All right, never mind. Moving right on. Okay, 
This next setting is um, one intended for people who need a visual um, alert when there's an audio warning. Um, but Maud decides that she doesn't really know what that is, perhaps, and she thinks, oh, do I want the screen to flash? Yeah, I, don't, I went don't off like, a bit about how the, don't like the, the center, center of, of the atom video camera is the nucleus, and it's a very small and fraction the of the total volume of the atom and the electron. Okay, so let's say she chooses, no, I don't want the screen flashing. Do you want to use an on-screen keyboard? If you're not very familiar with, with a laptop computer, you might not be very sure what that is. So um, here she's free to experiment and find out what that is. She can say yes and see in the preview the on-screen keyboard appearing. And um, most likely she's going to say to herself, well, I already have a keyboard. I don't need an on-screen keyboard. I'll just turn that off again, get rid of it, it's in the way. Okay, the next preference is a little different to all the other ones. Uh, instead of trying to explain a setting, it's asking her to demonstrate something about how she uses the computer. Here, here in this particular, in this prototype, uh, it's asking her to try typing the percent symbol. Okay, so she might go ahead and type percent. She's a teacher, she's used keyboards before, she knows how to do that. Um, and because she did that quite easily and quickly, um, there's no particular keyboard adjustment that is recommended for her. So the uh, next uh, screen says that she doesn't need keyboard adjustments and she can carry on. Okay, that was the final setting. So after going through all of those options, the tool shows a summary of what you actually chose. Um, so she can look through and say, yes, I've got English, I've got the text to speech off, I've got a certain speech rate. Uh, not all of these are things that she explicitly chose, but this is, this is a, a summary of the set of values that she has. She's using the white on black contrast and so on and so forth. And if she sees something there that's not what she expected or that she wants to go back and revisit, then she still has the option to return back to earlier steps and change something. Uh, if she's ready to finish, then she can carry on and um, gets to the final confirmation screen where um, it tells her that if she continues on to finish, she will have her settings saved. So I'll go along and do that. So her preferences are saved. Uh, they're saved for her machine and she can uh, carry on using her machine with those uh, with the high contrast, I think was the, the biggest thing that she picked, high contrast in the captions to help her. Okay. So she, in, the, in the process of doing this, she hasn't really had to learn a lot of jargon. She hasn't really had to learn how to use her laptop. She hasn't had to discover control panels and accessibility wizards and um, learn the, the terminology of the machine. She's had to uh, select items on the screen. She had to do a little bit of typing. Um, but, but in general, the tool doesn't um, ask for any real complex interactions. So the, the tool was pilot tested at four US locations this year, uh, this prototype. Uh, two of those locations were focused on seniors. Um, one was SeniorNet in a New York location, and another, the Oasis Institute, which is a, a nonprofit based in Missouri with a, a technology training program. The other two were a high school and a university that make strong use of, of online teaching resources. 
So from each of these sites, um, about 68 people were selected, a total of 27 people uh, were taken through the tool in um, one on one sessions. Some of the seniors had never used a computer before. I think three of them had never used a computer before. So they were uh, really great uh, target users to test on and really tough ones. Um, and we asked them to just, we, we, we put them in front of the tool and asked them to just go ahead and start using it without an explanation of what it really was and what, how to use it. We're trying to sort of as closely emulate the real um, way that somebody might have to use it. Okay, but we did ask them to think out loud as they were using the tool, tell us what was puzzling them, what uh, they didn't understand, um, and ask for help if they needed help. And the, the facilitator provided help if that was needed. Okay. Um, so what we found was that most of the participants were able to go through these 15 steps, but um, many of them needed some assistance, and especially the people who had a little or no computer experience needed some assistance. Um, the hardest thing for the people with no computer assistance was to try to just pick up a mouse and use that without any um, training or introduction, right? And the mouse is notoriously difficult to um, just just get. Maybe if they had been using a touch screen laptop or something, then things might have been a lot easier, but um, using the mouse was the biggest barrier, I think, that, that um, was observed in the sessions. Okay. Um, some of the participants, as they were going through the tool, discovered preferences that they didn't even know existed and hadn't heard about, had never tried before and actually really liked. So that was just sort of a little taste of the potential of a tool like this. The high contrast setting was, was one example of that and the um, reading the speech aloud was another example of that. Um, but we did find that although most of the participants could get through all the 15 steps, they often needed some prompting to really explore the preferences that were available and sometimes needed some help in understanding what each of these were. Um, let's see. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the overall design of the tool with this uh, preference control section and the preview section. Um, we pilot tested an earlier version of this tool uh, last year with some users. And that version didn't have any kind of a content preview as, as part of it. And one of the things we found there was that um, those users were really struggling to understand what the preferences meant and what value they should set. And the, the other challenge that we had was that because the tool had to have large text, if that text was the only text that the person was looking at, then when they come to set text size or magnification preference, they, they're already looking at text that's, that's pretty large. And so they might say, oh, that's fine, I can read that. But it doesn't really tell them when they come to a real web page with all different kinds of texts, different sizes of text, um, are they going to be able to read that? So one of the benefits of having a preview is to avoid, the, to, it sort of gives you more realistic um, view of what the thing that you've selected is going to look like on a, on a real web page. So that's, that's very important. Um, but for, for some of the preferences that works really well, right, for the letter spacing and the line spacing and the magnification and the colors, that works really well. For some of the preferences, like the video captions, as you saw, it could work really well if there's a video right there in the preview, but if the video is not obvious, then the person would have to um, scroll down and look to see if there was a video or might not even ever discover that there was a way to, to test the, the effect of that preference. Um, and then there are still other preferences where the preview is not 
really relevant or, or helpful at all. Um, so something like the, the sticky keys one, there's, there's no visual effect on the user interface for that. Um, and, and what the preview does is adds complexity to the interaction. Um, the user has to decide which part of the screen do I need to pay attention to now. So there's trade-offs in having a preview or no preview. And there's some interesting question about what really should be in the preview. Should it always be the same thing or should it change according to the preference that's being set? Um, and this attention problem gets worse in audio presentation. It's kind of easy to get lost in all this preview material. I can show you that in a minute. Um, so you could use the preview area for something that, that has targeted content for each setting, um, which is a little harder to set up in a new context, but might, be, uh, might overcome some of, some of that confusion, make the preview more useful. Um, okay, the um, sticky keys preference, I'm just gonna go back to that. Voice is on. This is step one of select. This is step two. Select. This is step. This. This is hard. So voice is off. Okay. So I didn't show what happens on this preference when the person appears to be having some trouble typing the percent symbol. Um, so I'm going to. Um, just press five, right? That's the, the key with percent on it, but I didn't manage to get the shift key to press it properly. Um, if, so this preference was included as an example of a very different kind of, of preference setting. Um, this is one where there's, it's going to affect the person using the computer in the way that they use it. Um, and actually a, a great example is the key repeat delay. So how fast the keys start to repeat when you hold them down. Um, but here we just use sticky keys because it was a, as, as a placeholder for this whole set of, of keyboard settings. So this is a, style of interaction where the person will demonstrate, the tool will infer what preferences might be useful and make suggestion to the user. And then the user uh, has the choice of turning on or off that suggested thing. So here the tool is suggesting sticky keys because it's detected that the person is typing with one finger or having trouble uh, shifting keys. And um, so there's a, a, an explanation here that, that has to be pretty short <clears throat> that explains what the person, what sticky keys does. And when sticky keys is on, you press the shift key, then you press the five key. So um, if Maud were to try this and turn on sticky keys, um, then I'm gonna press the shift key. And you can see that shift is active in the feedback here. Then I press the five key and I've got a percent. So, so this gives Maud the opportunity to try out the sticky keys setting. And she can turn it off again if that wasn't useful for her or leave it on. Um, now this step, was, this step was the hardest step in the tool for the users. Um, it was difficult to understand what was happening here, it was, it's different to the other steps where something is being explained and the user is making a decision. Um, here, this is a demonstrate, infer, and um, on the suggest type of an interaction. And these keyboard settings are, I, I think it was very important to include a setting like this in the prototype and, and try it out because these kind of keyboard settings don't work well in that um, 
in that mode of presentation where you just try to describe it and the person says, yes, I want this or no, I don't. I, that, that just doesn't really work for keyboard settings because you have to, to use them to really understand them. Um, the, the text explanation doesn't, um, doesn't use, it leaves open to a lot of uh, misunderstandings. So, so this was included, um, but it's not, um, the people who were in the user study weren't people with dexterity impairment, they weren't actual sticky keys users. So really what's been tested so far is how people who probably don't need sticky keys would um, find this preference and go through it in this setting. And what remains to be done is to uh, expand this and try to explore how really can we gather these kind of physical action preferences um, from people without confusing them, but, um, and I think that this, what this needs is a sort of combination of, of demonstration and inference. Okay, but that's, that's definitely something that's still for future work. Um, another thing that we didn't do is, um, test whether the settings that the people chose um, were sufficient for them to then access a computer afterwards, or at least enough for them to access a, another preference tool. Um, so that's also another piece of future work. We haven't really covered cognitive and cognitively impaired users or people with reading difficulties in the testing so far. But last year's pilot testing did include some people with, with difficulty reading who were um, able to get through the, the um, non-preview version of the tool. Okay, um, I want to step through one more time with a different person now, just before I finish off. So let's turn to um, Helen, who's blind. Helen's an experienced screen reader user, but she's arrived at a new school and she wants to set up her computer access preferences for the school network and all the school computers in the lab that she's gonna to have to use. Um, once she's got her preferences set up, she has a little card and she'll be able to go up to any machine and swipe her card and the computer will um, turn on the speech output for her. She can plug in her headphones and off she goes. Okay, but when she first gets to the college, she might go to the, um, computer access department and um, they will point her to this tool to get herself going. Okay, yes. Voice is on. Let's get this back to its original state. This is step one of 15. Select your preferred language press H to hear this again. Okay, so now let's go through this, but focus on the audio rather than what's on the screen. Okay, so the, the important thing is that the speech output for the tool is different to what a screen reader user would normally get. Right? This, this speech output also has to meet the needs of sighted people who want to use it in a sort of point to speak kind of a way. So, by pointing at an option, I ought to be able to hear that option. And rather than have it sort of read through the whole uh, stuff on the page and then respond to commands. But somebody, it, the, the people who were our testers who were screen reader users um, did express that they wanted to be able to use those keyboard shortcuts that they're familiar with and have uh, that familiar kind of interaction with this tool. So supporting that kind of um, keyboard control for experts as well as the, the um, mouse activated voice control together in parallel is another one of the, the design challenges that we've had here. Select to continue. Okay, so I'm going to use um, what Helen can do is she can use keyboard navigation 
uh, which would probably be very familiar to her, to go through what options there are in the tool. Select to turn voice off. So select to turn voice off. Definitely don't want to do that. English is currently selected. Oh, that's good. English is fine. Select to continue. Continue. Okay. I'm going to this is continue. step two of 15. Welcome. This tool will guide you through setting up your computer the way you like it best. Press H to hear this again. Okay, so when I move to a new screen, it's not reading out everything that's on the screen, but it's reading out what step we're on and what this screen is about. And um, I can use the tab key to move around and see what else is here. Select to go back to last step. All right. Select to go to next step. Okay. Go to this is step, step three of 15. Do you want to hear the screen read out loud? Press H to hear this again. Okay. So voice is on. Voice is currently on. That's select good. to go. Select to go to next step. I'm going to go to the next. Step. This is step four of fifteen. Change how fast or slow the voice reads out loud. Press H to hear this again. Well, that's good because as a screen select reader to user, slower, faster. I want to uh, make the voice a bit faster. Faster, 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 faster. Faster. So I'm just pressing faster. enter again faster. and again here. Faster. Faster. This is the fastest setting. This is the fastest setting. Okay. That's the fastest I can do. I'm going to go Slower. On. Select to go back to last step. Select to go to next step. All right. And I could listen to this on real content by moving forward into the this preview. preview. This is a search bar to search this website. Select to search this website. Select to go back to the physical science category. Select to search. This is, okay. this is the pre. Select to go to next step. That sounds good. I can understand. This is step that. five of fifteen. Choose a screen color to make things easier to see. Press H to hear this again. Okay, I, I'm not interested in choosing a screen color, so I'm just going to carry this on. This is step six of fifteen. Adjust the text and buttons to a size you like best. Press H to hear this again. I don't care about the size of the text and the buttons. So this is step seven of fifteen. On. Adjust the space between the letters to an amount you like best. Press H to hear this again. I don't care about the space between the letters either. This is step eight of fifteen. Adjust the space between the lines to an amount you like best. Press H to hear this again. I don't care about the space between lines. This is step 9 of 15. Do you want to see subtitles or captions? Text of the audio. When video is playing, press H to hear this again. I don't want captions. This is step 10 of 15. Do you want the screen to flash when a sound is played? Press H to hear this again. No, nope, no screen flashes. This is step 11 of 15. Do you want to use an on-screen keyboard? This would let you type by selecting letters on the screen. Press H to hear this again. I don't want an on-screen keyboard. This is step 12 of 15. Try using the keyboard in the space below. Press H to hear this again. Try Select to go back to last step. Type the percent symbol here. All right. Percent. You don't appear to need any keyboard adjustments. Please proceed to the next screen. Okay. Select to go back to last step. Select to go to next step. This is step 13 of 15. Confirm your settings. Your language choice is English. Your text to speech choice is on. Your speech rate choice is 266 words per minute. Your contrast choice is original. Your text size choice is 1.0x. Your letter space choice is 0.5x. Your line space choice is 1.2x. Your captions choice is on. Your show sounds choice is on. Your on-screen keyboard choice is off. Your sticky keys choice is off. Press H to hear this again. So uh, I noticed that uh, there are a couple of settings here that are on that I didn't specifically choose to be on. I just skipped past them, um, the, the captions and the show sounds. And so this brings up another one of the, the really interesting um, questions that we discovered in the process of the testing. If somebody doesn't make a change to the default value, what does that mean? Does that mean that value is the one that they want, or does it just mean that they skipped past it because they didn't care? And um, there isn't really a, a good way to know that if people are just able to, to skip past without having to, without having to make a selection. So there's a trade-off there between um, the amount of information that you gather and the um, demands that you make on the user because it's good to allow people to skip past. And in fact, even skipping past, some of the uh, participants felt like they were being asked about too many preferences that were not relevant to them. They wanted to be able to, to skip past ones that um, maybe even a whole group of, of ones that, that they weren't interested in. So that's one way to improve the interaction. Another is to reduce the uh, number of preferences. Um, if we test further and we find that not all of these are, are really essential for, for most people. The number of preferences could be reduced further, I think. Um, so just to summarize, this, this prototype illustrates 
a tool that could allow a technology user with some experience to express preferences that'll get them started. And with some assistance, it can also be used by complete novices. I think an important next step would be to test whether the preferences that people actually selected really were um, sufficient to allow them to then go on and access technology and get started. Um, there might be some essential preferences that are uh, need to be added, um, especially when we test with a broader set of user groups. And there might be some here that are rarely essential and could be removed. So, so does 